CanCOVID is an open science collective dedicated to rapidly mobilizing and sharing knowledge to help inform Canada's COVID-19 response. To learn more about us or how to join our community, you can visit our website at cancovid.ca. Hi, everyone, and welcome to CanCOVID Speaker Series. Thanks for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome Drs. John McLaughlin and Philip Adewala, who will be presenting to us on Support Canada, the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health, also known as CANPATH's COVID-19 Surveillance Initiative. Dr. McLaughlin is the Executive Director of CANPATH and also a professor at the Dalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Dr. Adewala is the National Scientific Director of CANPATH and also the Senior Investigator at Ontario's Institute for Cancer Research. Um, so before we get started, there's just a few items we note before every presentation. All audios and videos are disabled for participants, but we do welcome you to ask a question by typing it into the chat box at any point during or after the presentation. And finally, the sessions will be recorded and posted on CanCOVID's YouTube channel. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over the floors to our presenters. I'll always start with a unmute. So thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity, of course, to present to you today during um, uh, the work that uh, I'm going to be speaking about on behalf of the CANPATH partnership. Uh, I'm Philip Awadala, National Scientific Director. I'm at U of T and at the OICR, and John McLaughlin will be joining me later on in the presentation, and he's the Executive Director, and he's also at the University of Toronto. So uh, it's a great pleasure to talk about what we're doing within the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health, um, Canada's population cohort, specifically um, in support of COVID research. And so I'll be uh, giving a bit of preamble about what our uh, work is uh, supporting uh, with regard to other research, uh, telling you a little bit about um, the, the Canadian Partnership as a population cohort. And then we'll be spending most of the time or the majority of this time um, talking about how we are leveraging that cohort, uh, this cohort to support COVID research. Um, so, my, uh, uh, there we go. So, uh, CANPATH is a population cohort. It is not a clinical cohort, it is a population cohort, and it's a longitudinal population cohort. And we uh, have for many years made the argument that population cohorts are critical, are critical elements. Um, to any, um, if, if you like, a nation's ability to track who develops what diseases over time. So they're critical in terms of capturing information, not just in terms of who has a disease, but who in terms of who also develops a disease. And these cohorts are really powerful in that sense because we can push the envelope in terms of our research and an investigation into the factors that lead to the development of disease because we capture lots of information about our participants. Um, in this case in Canada, um, for many years, and we do this repeatedly over many time points as well. So CANPATH stands for the Canadian Partnership for Tomorrow's Health, as I've mentioned already, um, is Canada's largest population health study, and it's a national platform for health research. We have recruited over 330,000 participants already, um, and we've been um, at baseline, and we have been following these participants across Canada, almost from, all, from almost all provinces, uh, for the past, I'd say, 10 to 12 years. Um, so this is a reflection, or a, this is a map of Canada, of course, and as I mentioned before, we now have engagement from all provinces, um, with uh, Quebec and Alberta being the first out of the gate in recruitment, and our newest members are uh, coming in from uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, this gives you a really quick snapshot of the kinds of information we capture at baseline. Our participants consent, and when they consent, they fill out questionnaire information, we capture biologics from those participants. Some participants have completed, I've been um, invited to an assessment center where we captured physical measures and even MRIs. Um, samples of already biologics are stored in biobanks. Genomics, epigenomics, uh, transcriptomics, et cetera, um, is already being developed from the cohort as well. And also a key component of, this, of the cohort is that almost all of our participants have consented to linkage through to administrative health records. Um, and that's an important and valuable piece of data follow-up. We can track people through administrative linkages, just like we do with questionnaires to see who develops um, diseases over time. It is a national cohort, and that's the last thing I want to mention here is uh, while we have a lot of operational activities happening, 
as a partnership in the regions, it really is a partnership and all the data is harmonized as a single data set. And John will talk a little bit about that at the end of the, near the end of the presentation. Um, these are just the names of the regional cohorts. I quickly mentioned Quebec and Alberta. Quebec is under the name of Cartagena. Alberta is the Alberta's Tomorrow Project. I also lead the Ontario Health Study as well as being the National Scientific Director. But again, this is a partnership of a number of cohorts across a number of provinces as well. Just a really quick mention, um, it is a population cohort. So we've captured lots of information at baseline about our participants. So we have information and numbers about who was diagnosed or being, as being hypertensive, who are the cancer participants. We also capture information over time as to who develops these diseases. But really the one thing I wanted to mention with this particular slide here is that there is a marker paper here. And if you're really interested in finding more, um, the, the marker papers in the CMAJ, it was published two or three years ago. So the, what I'm really here to talk about today is our program called Support Canada, um, which is our, uh, our funded activities to support uh, COVID research using and leveraging the CANPATH cohort. And what I really wanted to do here, and first of all, I wanted to mention that almost all of the analyses you're going to be seeing here comes from uh, Victoria Kirsch, who is uh, who's also a faculty at U, U of T, but is, a, is, a, is a, one of our key scientists in the Ontario Health Studies and epidemiologists in the Ontario Health Study at the OICR. And we were funded uh, last summer um, by both the CIHR and the Public Health Agency of Canada through the COVID Immunity Task Force to start capturing information, both from surveys. Um, we've got two surveys now, two time points of surveys from where we started off with capturing information from 100,000 participants, capturing blood samples from participants so we can uh, test for antibodies to both COVID as well as antibodies um, in the context of pre and post vaccine immune profiling. So also want to thank Victoria again, as well as Kimberly Speed, who certainly helped us support or certainly helped um, and developed the, uh, the funding applications. And uh, we're also very grateful to the CIHR and PHAC for supporting this activity. So one of the things that I really want to highlight as well is that CANPATH as well as a position to study um, high risk groups. Um, we are representative of much of the diaspora of Canada. Canada is a very white population. Um, and what you're going to see here, of course, is that CANPATH reflects that. But we also have large numbers of these other groups as well. So one of the things that we are doing, and we'll come back to this later, um, is supporting activities in what were called priority populations when it comes to COVID, high prevalence regions, newcomers, self-declared Indigenous and long-term care residents. Um, there are some groups in here that have been highlighted, um, largely because they're not in the Canadian census. The red bars are the Canadian, uh, are the Canadian census, the blue bars are CANPATH. The Canadian census doesn't capture Jewish and East Asian, but you can see that we've identified or captured that information from our participants as well. In March of last year, CANPATH mobilized immediately to start capturing information from, from the CANPATH participants with our first launch of our surveys. And those surveys are, constitute our baseline COVID-19 questionnaire where we were initially capturing information about COVID-19 test results, symptoms experienced, if any, participant hospitalizations, health status, um, travel, potential source of exposure, impact of the pandemic on job status, and a lot of information about mental and emotional health. Um, and so I'm just going to be giving you over the next number of slides, some, some I, I would just say highlights right now. Uh, what I want to say is that these are highlights are giving you a taste or flavor of some of the data that we've been able to capture for, in this case, 100,000 Canadians. Um, so we've been capturing inf information about, say, sex and gender differences, minority-ish differences with regard to people, how people responded to the pandemic and how the pandemic affected individuals differently. So for example, we, we captured information about social distancing, who was washing their hands more regularly, wearing a mask, I'm not gonna read all of this, who was wearing gloves in public. We also saw that women were more likely to say, wear masks, stay at home, stay, stock up on essentials and so on compared to men. So we've captured, again, I wanna highlight that these are information that has been captured. And for those who are interested, you can get access to this information as well. As I mentioned before, one of the things that we were also able to capture were the racial inequities. Um, ethnic minorities were 2.1 times more likely to be infected with regard in, in the CANPATH cohort. 
Um, socioeconomic factors, of course, have, have an, had an impact as well. So I'm not, again, going to go into all of this data with you here today, but again, wanna highlight the fact that um, they, these socioeconomic factors, we've captured how they impact different groups in the CANPATH cohort, and they do impact different groups within the CANPATH cohort differently as well. Um, you can see, for example, here in light blue, uh, we have our indigenous individuals here in white, are, 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 sorry, red are, are people who self-declared as white. Um, we also captured information with regard to risk of COVID-19 infection by occupation. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is that this is actually data coming from our follow-up survey. This is actually high, this has been updated and this is information coming up, uh, coming to us uh, this year. Um, our baseline was captured last year and this is information coming to us um, as our, uh, well, we still have the, the questionnaire in the field in fact. So we can see here that the odds ratios uh, are, are significant certainly for people who work at, in airlines or at the airport, grocery workers, factory workers, and so on. Um, actually, when I want to highlight servers, of course, are on that one side. Whoa, uh, servers are on the one side of this, of the odds ratio of one, of course, because we've had closures in that context. Um, obviously, there are gender gaps that we've been able to capture as well. I've mentioned them already before. Um, Nationwide, women are overrepresented in specific industries, specifically hospitality and food, retail, educational services. So the impact of closures has been infecting, um, for example, uh, well, they've been impacting women more so than men. Uh, last few, a few things I want to highlight before, ta um, uh, before we start getting into serology uh, are a few things like risk factors. Um, we've heard already through media, through numerous publications that age is obviously a major risk factor. Cardiovascular disease is a risk factor for not just COVID, but also risk of hospitalization and BMI specifically as well. All of these factors, I just wanna, the, the, to some extent, this is highlighting a lot of the, um, the, the information captured in CANPATH because all of this information was already captured by our, our, our 330,000 participants as well. Um, this uh, particular slide is highlighting um, some of the information that we captured with regard to symptoms and exposures. And uh, this was initially captured by our colleagues in Quebec, Philippe Brouet, uh, where he uh, determined that, um, that uh, in the Quebec cohort, and we've seen this again across Canada, is that loss of smell was, was, a, was a, and we've heard about loss of smell being one of the first symptoms, of course, associated with COVID infection. And loss of cell explains exact, a, a substantial proportion of positive infection, in fact, more so than almost anything else, in fact, including fever. Um, so that loss of smell and loss of smell and headache are primary factors associated with, uh, or explaining at least variation more so than almost any other factor. Uh, finally, one thing I want to highlight again, and this emphasizes that going forward, particularly thinking a little bit about um, who's being hospitalized and the potential long-term effects on health. We've captured a lot of information on our participants in CANPATH with regard to morbidities or comorbidities. Um, I mentioned before at the very beginning of the talk that we've got numbers associated with, uh, we know who's been diagnosed with, uh, with cancers, uh, diabetes, lung disease, and so on. So we'll be following that information over time as well. Um, and as well with that, we also have information much of this updated in our surveys with regard to medication usage as well. Of course, these immunosuppressives are going to be super important. And some of these other ACE inhibitors of these angiotensin receptor blockers, we know to be um, uh, critical factors with regard to uh, disease severity, as well as potentially vaccine efficacy. In fact, that finally, I would just want to mention that we also are capturing information on who in our cohort are our long, long haulers. I think these, are, this, these numbers will rise over time. This is coming from our first pass of the data. And with that said, um, we'll be seeing, uh, we'll be following these participants over time. Uh, some work that we're doing in Ontario is linking the, uh, the, the cohort data with our, um, uh, the Ontario Laboratory Information System. So these are all Ontario Health Study participants um, who are part of CANPATH naturally. And what we're seeing here is the number of participants that are new cases in the Ontario Health Study. That's the pink line. The blue line are the number of tests of Ontario Health Study participants that are being captured in OLS. And you, you'll, you'll note that the number of tests are, are large over time. And that's because what we see with the number of the OHS participants and many of our participants were being repeatedly tested, in fact, and that could have been due to work or so on. 
Okay, so the last thing, a few slides I'm going to be talking about, I think to some extent this is very hot off the press, literally analyzing this data on Friday so that we could present this data to you. And Vicky did a great job of putting this data together is some of our early serological results. Um, and uh, we, we've been uh, spending a fair bit of time uh, capturing information from both all across the cohort, but also capturing information with regard to serology, pre and post vaccine. So uh, thanks in part to the CIHR and the CITF, we're collecting dry blood spots. We wanted to target 20,000 participants from three primary groups, uh, residents of long-term care areas with high prevalence of COVID and people living in underserved urban and rural communities. Um, our participation rates were around 90%. So we're actually seeing around 30,000 participants. And so we'll be capturing information for 30,000 participants. From the most recent assays and surveys, we're capturing inf information about vaccine hesitancy, uh, vaccine acceptance. So you can see that in our court, vaccine acceptance is very high compared to the population, population average. Um, we've got some hesitant participants ranging around four to five percent. Um, that seems to be the largest in Alberta on average, and people who are out outright refusing are in less than a one percent in CanPath. Big thanks to Anne Claude Gingra and Karen Colwell at um, Sinai at the Lunenfeld Institute, who are capturing three antibody specific tests for antibodies um, in the CANPATH cohort. I'm not going to say much about this slide here. This is just a kind of a, one of the QCs that we're looking at. We now have data from 3,000 participants. Actually, we have data from 5,000 participants. I'm showing you only data from 3,000 because this is literally coming in as it comes. You're seeing this as it comes. And so what you're seeing here are the results of, uh, of, of, of serology associated or seroconversion due to either um, viral exposures at some point or vaccine exposures. So these are results, for example, here, this dark purple line is an indication of a COVID positive test. And you can see that our antibodies to the nucleocapsid protein are consistent with somebody self-reporting a COVID positive test. So that's what you're seeing here. Um, and so you're not seeing the same sort of signature for the other um, uh, things that we're looking at here. But when we look at antibodies like spike protein and receptor binding proteins in people who are singly vaccinated alone, um, you're naturally seeing, so here we got spike over here and you've got uh, receptor binding domains over here and Pfizer, AstraZeneca and Moderna are these three different colors. You're seeing that Pfizer and Moderna are showing very elevated quantitative numbers, if you like, for antibodies, AstraZeneca is reduced, but significantly higher than you would expect in, say, people who hadn't been vaccinated, excuse me. Um, we did see that for AstraZeneca, 15% of the participants who did claim that they had been vaccinated, but we didn't see a threshold higher level of antibodies were people who are largely AstraZeneca um, vaccinated with a single dose. So that's one interesting uh, piece of information we were able to capture here as well. We also saw an influence of age on vaccine response as well. Um, age is going up here and you're seeing that the numbers of antibodies are going down for both spike and, uh, and uh, receptor binding domains. Um, receptor binding domains over time following vaccine. So days since vaccine tends to go up. So you've heard a lot about, you have to wait two weeks to three weeks before you get a full immune response after one shot. Not a, it's, it's actually not a full immune response after one shot. And you're seeing that over time, the number, the, the, the level of antibodies goes up with time. Um, same thing for, S for the spike protein as well. And this is both for the single dose mRNA vaccines as well as the AstraZeneca. And with the AstraZeneca, it actually stays pretty flat. Um, these are for these. This data is coming in for those individuals for who are fully vaccinated. So this is the data only for people for Pfizer, Bio, uh, Pfizer, Moderna. Um, here's the receptor binding domain. Here's the spike proteins. These are people who have had two doses of vaccine, and you can see that the immune response is generally extremely high for both for those individuals who have had uh, two doses. So um, at this point, I'm gonna turn this over to John, uh, who's going to talk to you about uh, the court and access to this data. Um, thank you very much, uh, Philip. And um, um, I will be quite brief in my final remarks. It's really largely, as you can see on this particular slide, to recognize that there are many 
contributors to this particular work. Uh, so many organizations are hosting the regional cohorts. There are teams across uh, now every province of Canada, and uh, maybe someday it would be possible to reach out to the territories as well. There are several funders. Uh, the national funder is the Canadian Partnership uh, Against Cancer, and then there are regional funders as well. Next slide, please. This shows too that, uh, um, pardon the suit jacket, I don't seem to wear that kind of thing anymore in COVID, but the, uh, basically there is a team of scientific and operational leaders across every province who actually enable work like this to be done in every province of Canada, which is really quite remarkable. Um, a great scientific team, uh, next slide. And uh, important for today's presentation, please note that um, these data are actually collected for the purposes of the research community to uh, work with these data. Philip and uh, Vicki Kirsch and the team that put the slides together have done a remarkable job of initial analyses of the data, but really uh, remember that there are many other dimensions of the data that can be used uh, to understand the patterns, the determinants, the outcomes of COVID, the full impacts of COVID on Canadians. Here I'm emphasizing the portal, uh, which is where you can go on the web. I've also placed this information in the chat for you, but uh, you can go to the portal to, uh, to gain access to and learn how to access the, these uh, CANPATH data. Next slide, please. The, uh, uh, the range of data was briefly mentioned by Philip at the outset, but you can see that from blood, from serum, from um, uh, physical and biological measures, as well as environmental measures, these are very, very comprehensive data. So it's not only the COVID questionnaire, it's all of the other information that's available on CANPATH participants. Next slide. And then uh, the types of research that can be done uh, are, are also extremely rich. And this includes genotyping. Presently, 45,000 participants across all of CANPATH have actually had uh, genotyping done. Uh, 10,000 approximately have had uh, MRI imaging done for the purposes of better understanding heart and uh, CNS um, outcomes. And you can see the rich a range of measures that are possible with a cohort like this. Next slide. Uh, there is a national coordinating center. The, perhaps the most important are the, the people who actually make sure that the data come in and then are securely um, maintained in a rigorous way that's con consistent with all of the you know, best in class standards of data privacy, data protection, uh, respecting the ethics that are essential and then um, serving the research community. Next slide. And then really the final, this is the final slide for me, is to really just acknowledge that it's uh, really remarkable to see that over 300,000 Canadians have participated in CANPATH, which really enabled in the pandemic for over 100,000 participants to complete a questionnaire very rapidly. Those data were posted on the portal in, um, in January. And now, as Philip has reported, the emergence of the immunotyping, uh, the, the, the seroprevalence type of data that is also emerging. What was presented today is just a snapshot of what's more to come uh, because uh, we rely on the research community to make the most of these data. And then also the, uh, the data from the participants is continuing to stream in. So the, the preliminary snapshot that you see today is really just uh, um, uh, to interest you in participating with us in uh, working with this rich data set that is so important to Canada. I'll stop there, and I think that leaves some time for questions, which I think are to appear in the chat if you are able. Thank you so much, Dr. McLaughlin and Dr. Adewala. And yes, it is the um, time for question and answer period. We have about six minutes. Um, so just to all participants, uh, feel free to uh, ask a question in the chat box at any point. Um, but I just wanted to highlight here, there was a question on the age range of participants in the cohort. And I think uh, Dr. McLaughlin, you kindly answered that, that it's um, the recruitment at the time were ages 36 to 74, but they are followed prospectively over many years. 
Well, um, I, was, so, I will add actually that it's probably 35. It was a little typo there. So uh, don't ever rely on what you see in a chat for your final product. Also the, the marker paper by Dummer et al that uh, Philip actually referred to describes that baseline population in, in very nice detail. So please refer to uh, the Trevor Dummer's paper. Thank you. Okay, as we're waiting for some questions, um, I know we, we sort of talked about this off screen before we, we, we started the, the, the presentation, uh, but perhaps uh, either uh, Dr. Adewala or Dr. McLaughlin, you could speak to, you know, maybe the, you know, as the pandemic evolves and as, you know, uh, hopefully we get out of this soon, uh, what are the uh, next steps uh, for CANFAS in this area? Cool. So we'll, we'll start with, I mean, you know, to some extent, there's some business as usual. We are a national, we were a population cohort supporting a broad range of disease and health research before, before COVID. And that hasn't really stopped. In fact, what COVID has done is was actually doubled the amount of work that the cohort has had to do because we've now introduced our activities in this space. With regard to COVID, I think primarily we're interested in, uh, I mentioned long-term long haulers, people who are suffering, um, uh, symptoms for for extended periods of time. There's also the work that we're interested um, relates to the serological work that we're that we've um, that are looking at antibodies and vaccine efficacy over time. Um, we're in an interesting space in Canada, in particular, given that we've got a larger proportion of individuals who've had only one shot or one dose of a vaccine for a much longer in a period of time than was initially intended. Um, or at least that's you know we've, what the clinical trials were supporting. So um, of course every, uh, there is you know, you know a large emphasis to get two shots into people's arms now. Um, there's still that even with one or two shots, tracking vaccine efficacy and serological response over time, I think is important. So we'll be we'll be following our participants uh, over the next while with regard to those types of analyses. So. If I can add to that, um, in addition to the really important uh, biological aspects that were the focus of uh, Philip's presentation today, and everyone here, you're seeing it very, very fresh. This is the first time this has actually been uh, available, and we're we're still working on all of that uh, really for for the research community. Um, the uh, the other element is that the questionnaire data that was collected before is also available on the portal, and for the, the full impacts of COVID to be known amongst Canadians. It is important to look at such things as mental health impacts, employment impacts, uh, what's, uh, what's, what are those long-term uh, outcomes, some of which can be obtained through the, uh, the, the smaller subsets like we reported on today, but we'd encourage, I'd encourage the, uh, part, uh, the the people on today's webinar to uh, consider to go to the website I gave you the um, in the chat I gave you the website address you can look up to see just what's there. Uh, I think it's quite clear that uh, COVID has the pandemic uh, impacts, but it's got the long term impacts, and the only way those can actually be monitored is through a platform like this where people have committed their time, their information, their biospecimens, but also a willingness to be part of a long-term assessment. This is a, the only place in Canada where that's possible. There's no other mechanism uh, for um, the health research community to uh, work with such a dedicated group of Canadians. So there are a number of uh, long-term uh, uh, directions that your question points to, Rosa, so thank you. Oh, no problem. And we have a few other questions in the chat box uh, that just popped up. So um, will these new serology results be posted on CANPAT's site or going to publication? Uh, we're, so, uh, sorry, yes, we'll, we'll, we're definitely aiming for both. Um, uh, we tried to make sure that people on the website are aware of what data we have. And so the results as they're coming in, I want to say as they're coming in, we try, we do are presenting them in a way that's somewhat obvious, both not just to research scientists, but also to participants. And one thing I did want to mention was one of the reasons we have such high participation rates is that we are returning results back to our participants with regard to serological information. There's a second question here as well. Yes. And the second like, question is, um, would you consider expanding the age range to gather data on impacts of COVID-19 in younger adults and youth? Yeah, so we were just having that discussion quite a lot last week, in fact, um, and uh, so it's a great point. Uh, 
we were trying to balance what of the cohort did we want to target more. I was leaning initially to looking at um, cancer survivors, right? I was interested in whether uh, people who have been subject to medications or treatment to cancer would see the same, what kind of degree of vaccine ev efficacy, if any, would be, could we observe there? Um, the median age of our cohort is now 69. Uh, it's one of those, it's an aging cohort. We do have a number of individuals who are in the younger range, of course, in the core, but young in this case is probably 50, so, or 45 to 50. So we've had these conversations. I, I think the thing what we're thinking about here is um, that might be interesting to improve our baseline and our comparison as well. So some have advocated for going after the, for, for a younger age group. Uh, is there side effect information of vaccine collected? Um, we are ca capturing side effect information from the participants in the most up to, uh, in the our most uh, our current uh, survey. So if I could just uh, add a tiny bit to both of those points. Clearly, there are other ways of monitoring adverse or side effects of vaccines, and the idea of having a cohort like this is really to complement those other uh, other sources and other um, other approaches. You know, ideally of vaccine registries and side effects of each person's experience should actually be something that's reported. And in fact, we're in a position with the consent that all of the participants have given that being able to link to those registries is possible. So even being able to monitor uh, long-term effects and uh, as, as Philip said before, for some of the sort of the syndromic or long-term hauler types of things, that those types of um, outcomes through linkage could be monitored. Uh, back to the point about younger age ranges, we, you would have seen through the fact that this was funded in the first instance by cancer agencies and cancer um, with a cancer focus to try to fill in the gap about what data is missing to help us improve cancer and chronic disease prevention. So that's the only reason why young people were not included. It was the later age um, that was the focus for that reason. Of course, we're interested. We know the impacts are real. Uh, a la large population-wide cohort approach can solve a lot of important Canadian health questions. It's a matter of um, you know, basically coming together as a research community and making the case to expand that kind of recruitment into the other age ranges or the other groups, uh, the other parts of Canada where it can really add value. All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, there's additional question, but we are out of time. Um, but I do want to just take the opportunity to, on behalf of the Ken COVID team and network, we'd like to thank you for your time to present to us on this really uh, important topic and the exciting uh, research that you guys just recently analyzed for us. So thanks so much. Um, and uh, just a few announcements before we do uh, end the session. Uh, please join us for the next speaker series, uh, which will be held next uh, Tuesday, June 15th at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, to hear from Dr. Angela Mashford Pringle from the University of Toronto to present to us on Indigenous health and uh, the results from a qualitative uh, research. Uh, so um, thanks so much, everyone, and hope you uh, enjoy the rest of your days. We would like to thank our speakers and members of our network for their continued support and participation in Canada's pandemic response. If you are interested in learning more about CanCOVID or joining our pan-Canadian COVID-19 research network, please visit our website at www.cancovid.ca.